What if you could take Ben Eater's iconic 6502 project and instead of just displaying Hello World on a liquid crystal display, you could turn it into a fully functional Commodore VIC-20 without using the original VIC chip and no FPGA in sight. Sounds crazy, right? Well, in this series, that's exactly what we're going to do. I'm Matt Regan, I've got a PhD in computer science, and I previously worked on designing GPUs at NVIDIA. But today, I'm taking a trip back in time to the early 1980s. No, not that sort of trip. Instead of relying on custom chips, I'm going to replace the VIC chip with nothing but TTL logic and a few EEPROMs. And, to top it off, we'll be outputting a modern VGA signal. We'll start by debugging Ben Eater's breadboard 6502 project and rebuilding it on perfboard, but that's just the beginning. From there, I'll walk through how to build a raster generator and create a monochrome video system. After that, we dive into graphics mode and colour, and of course, we won't forget about sound. This is going to be one wild nostalgic ride, so let's see if we can turn the breadboard 6502 into a Commodore VIC-20. Why buy just a video game from Atari or Intellivision? Invest in the wonder computer of the 1980s for under $300. The Commodore VIC-20. Unlike games, it has a real computer keyboard. With the Commodore VIC-20, the whole family can learn computing at home. Plays great games, too. Under $300, the wonder computer of the 1980s, the Commodore VIC-20. Coming soon, Commodore brings you Gorf, the wonder arcade game, and Omega Race in home versions. Commodore. Here's Ben Eater's design. We can see the Western Design Center 65CO2, a 32 kilobyte static RAM chip, and a 32 kilobyte EEPROM. Well, EEPROM, electrically erasable programmable read only memory. This chip is a 65C22, which is a versatile interface adapter, and it's used to connect the CPU to the LCD display and key switches. From the CPU's perspective, there are only really five different types of transactions. Reading from the EEPROM, writing to and reading from the static RAM, and also writing to and reading from the VIA. That's pretty much well it. That's really all the CPU can directly access. The CPU alone decides whether it wants to read or write, and this signal, the read write bar line, tells the rest of the circuit what the CPU wants to do. I've wired up my own version of the Hello World 6502 base breadboard machine. I'm not going to show the build here, you can see that on Ben Eater's videos, but I will go over the two main bugs they found. It's slightly embarrassing to publicly admit your mistakes, but I want to show you how easy it is to slip up and show an approach that I use to get the machine going. The big difference with my build is that I don't have a 1 MHz oscillator, so I've used this 16 MHz oscillator and I divide the signal by 16 with a 74HC161. This little power board that I use has a 555 timer, which can also be used to clock the circuit. This means I can choose between a fast clock and a slow clock whenever I want. I've used an extra breadboard compared to Benita because I like to have these 600mm chips straddle the power rail. If I put in some small jumpers in the middle, this essentially gives me seven different breadboard wiring locations per pin, compared with two or three the way Ben Eater does it. As a result, it's much easier to lay the wires flat on the board, which, at least in my opinion, makes the build a little bit more robust. When I think the board's complete, but before I power it on, I like to do a visual inspection, check that all the chips are in the right way, and no obvious errors. Next, I check to make sure there isn't a dead short between power and ground. Sometimes I place a reverse bias power diode, which protects the circuit if I connect the power up the wrong way. I've done that more than once. Next, apply the power and check the voltage on all the chips. Chips in the 748C series are actually pretty forgiving in this respect. They will tolerate quite a big voltage range. When there's a microprocessor, I check the reset and clock signal. They were both good in this case, but there was no hello world on the display. Now, the important thing here isn't to have a heart sink moment. You've got to expect it not to work. I have a crappy old scope, which is over 20 years old, and I know many of you don't want to rush out and buy an expensive logic analyzer, so I try to do as much debug as I can using simple and cheap methods. Bring in the logic probe. 
This is a simple device that tells if a signal is high, low, or oscillating, but it also tells if a signal is floating. I usually go around all the chips to see if any signals are floating, and I discovered this. A0 on the EEPROM is floating, all the time. I know that the 65CO2 should be driving this signal, so that's just wrong. When I had a closer look at the board, there's nothing connected to A0. A1 on the EEPROM is connected to A0 on the SRAM, so it looks like all of these signals are out by one position. Now I could rewire all of these connections, or I could just run these connecting jumpers at an angle. Guess which one I'm going to do? Yep, the angle. OK, still no joy. Now I really need to know what the microprocessor is doing. I want to be able to clock the CPU slowly, which I can do with the Western Design Center 65 CO2 because it's a CMOS part, but the 6522V I have isn't. I do have some CMOS parts on order, but they haven't arrived yet. According to the specs, I need to clock this part at at least 100 kilohertz, so I'll just pull it out for now. Next, I'm going to add some LEDs, red for data signals and blue for address signals, which is my own personal convention. Notice that it matches the wire colors too. This bank is for D0, and I can just use some spare pins on the breadboard. Next, A0 to A7, and finally, A8 to A15. What I'm going to do is manually reset the machine, because the CPU needs at least two clocks in reset, and then I'll let it run and record it. After that, I can analyze the video and annotate it. The alternative is to single step the circuit, which is a valid debug technique, but in part, I'm doing this so I can show it to you. Single stepping is great, but usually I start to get confused about 10 steps in, so this video technique is really good for subtle bugs. I've annotated what the machine is doing, and I can compare it to the code that the CPU should be running. So far, so good. Now, I actually missed this on the first pass, but the V is located at 6000 hex. So the upper nibble should be 0110, whereas what I'm seeing here is 0100, which is 4000 hex. I noticed this happening time and time again. There's actually another clue in this sequence, but I missed it the first time I watched it. I can see the CPU reading 6000 hex in the upper byte of the address, but it's only outputting 4000 to the address bus. I know the LED's good, which means it's not shorting to power or ground. OK, back to visual inspection. I can trace out A13. It goes from the CPU to the SRAM, then to the EEPROM. But the VIA needs this signal also. It tracks across the chip with this wire, and then travels up towards the CPU and VIA. This is interesting. Why is it going in two directions here? It goes to VIA pin 24, which it's meant to, but it also goes back to pin 16 of the CPU, which is A8. It looks like A13 is shorted to A8, and that would certainly explain why the fetches to page FF showed the LED. Both A8 and A13 are high, but for addresses to 6000, A13's high and A8's low. So this is likely to cause a problem. I also thought, hang on, the stack's located at 100 hex. For a stack operation, A8's high and A13's low. Hmm, let's see if I can see that in the video. Sure enough, during the JSR instruction, the CPU saves the return address to the stack, so I should see A8 lit up here. It's missing. Now, this is what I missed on the first time I watched the video, but it certainly makes sense now. OK, let's remove this wire link. Let's pop the wire back in, connect up the 1 MHz clock, and voila, it works. Excellent. Excellent! Now, I'm not going to try and build the entire VIC-20 on breadboards. Instead, I'm planning to use perf board with point-to-point -point soldering. This is actually my preferred construction technique for larger prototypes. Let's look at the VIC-20 circuit diagram. We have the 6502 CPU. We have a bank of SRAMs, which we can actually just think of a single SRAM. Similarly, we have three ROMs, which we can just replace with a single EEPROM. And instead of having one VIA chip, the VIC-20's got two. There is this region on the top right, which contains the VIC chip and another memory, and we'll deal with that in another video. Essentially, in the VIC-20, the 6502 has 11 main transactions. One big difference in this design compared to Ben Eder's design is this wall of 74HC245s. 
These are octal tri-state buffers, which means we can effectively isolate the CPU address and data bus from the memory's address and data buses. When the CPU clock's high, data can flow through these chips, but when the CPU clock's low, these signals are blocked. If we look at the timing diagram for the 6502, we only really need access to the memory when clock bar's high. But for the rest of the clock cycle, we actually let the VIC chip have access to the memory. This means that the video system and the 6502 share access to the static RAM. First, I want to get the Hello World demo working on the new build, but I need some way for the video system and the CPU to access the system memory. If possible, I'd like to avoid having this separate memory for color data, and I'd rather it all just go into the one static RAM chip. For the data bus, I'm planning to use the 74HC245 to isolate the memory and CPU, and that's basically the same as the VIC-20, but I'll put that in later. To start with, for the Hello World example, I'll just wire the CPU data bus directly to the memory. That's one of the great things about prototyping. You can actually modify the design for different stages of bring up. The address bus is different. Instead of tri-state buffers, I'm going to use a 4 to 1 multiplexer per bit. The 74HC153 has two of these per chip, so I'm going to need eight chips in total for a 16-bit address bus. When both select inputs are low, data is transferred from input 0 to the output. For 0, 1, input 1 is selected. 1, 0, input 2. And 1, 1, input 3 goes to the output. You can speculate in the comments why I might be using a 4 to 1 multiplexer instead of a 2 to 1 multiplexer like the 74HC157. Here's the schematic diagram for the machine in its current state. It will post on GitHub. But remember, it's incomplete at this stage. It's just for getting the Hello World example to work. I have a 16x2 liquid crystal display on the left, and we know that the VIC-20 has two VIA chips, so I'll wire both of them in now. But I'll disable one of them. Next is the 65CO2, then 8 of the 74HC153 4 to 1 multiplexers. After that, we have the 628128 static RAM chip, which is actually much larger than I need. It has a capacity of 128 kilobytes, but I just happen to have plenty of them on hand. I'm going to wire in two EEPROMs, one for system code and the other for game cartridge storage. Again, these chips are much larger than I need. I'll use a pair of 27C4001s, which store 512 kilobytes, but I could get away with a 32 kilobyte part, like the 27C256. By using a larger EEPROM, I should be able to store 64 8K games or 32 16K games. Just like I did on the Benita breadboard prototype, I want to be able to put LEDs on the address and data lines for debugging but these are optional and I haven't shown them in the schematic diagram. This is the layout for the board. It pretty much matches the ordering in the schematic diagram except for the LCD. I'll go through the wiring relatively quickly. These are the memory address lines going from the bank of multiplexes on the right to the static RAM and EEPROMs on the left. I'm using a 10 watt soldering iron, which is really good for this sort of fine work but I generally turn the temperature up higher than I normally would because the tip seems to have a low thermal inertia and it cools down as soon as it melts solder. Now I'm wiring up the CPU address bus. These are the signals going from the 65CO2 to the bank of multiplexes. Here's the data bus. I checked the timestamps for the videos, and what you're seeing here was done over four sessions and it took about six hours in total. I usually don't film wiring up the power rails and decoupling capacitors, so I'd guesstimate that's another hour. I'll talk about this construction technique as we go along with the build, but you might notice that many of the bus signals are just one wire, soldered at many locations, and I do this by sliding the Kynar insulation into place between the solder joints. There is a trick to this which I'll go over in the next video. This is the connection to the LCD. I usually don't show wiring for the power rails because, well, it's kind of boring. And I also leave out the control signals because they're a bit too messy to follow on camera. Because the joints are soldered, the result's a bit more robust than breadboard wiring. That's all wired up. 
this is essentially the same as the breadboard version of Benita's design. The big difference is that all the CPU address lines go through this bank of 4 to 1 multiplex before touching the memory. At the moment, the multiplexes are hardwired to only pass the CPU address through, but this will change when we introduce video later. The point is, I want to show the evolution from Ben Eater's design to the VIC-20. Let's see if it works. Notice that I'm using the same trick I used for the breadboard build, and sure enough, it paid off again. I only had one bug on this board. I'd wired up the chip select signal on the VIA to A9 instead of A13. I used the right pin, just the wrong side of the chip. Sometimes it can get confusing when looking from underneath. Excellent. As you can see, we've successfully rebuilt and debugged our version of Benita 6502 system. We've got the core of the project up and running, but this is just the beginning. In the next video, we're going to tackle something really interesting, the video subsystem. We'll be building it from scratch, no VIC chip and no shortcuts, just TTL logic and some good old-fashioned EEPROMs. It'll be tricky, but by the end of the next video, we'll have a functional Raston generator capable of driving a VGA display. After that, we'll get a monochrome display working, and from there, we'll move towards getting colour to work. So, stick around, because what good's a VIC-20 without some killer video output? I'll see you in the next video.